If you hadn't seen it with your own eyes, you might not be able to believe that he committed such a horrible crime. This is not a fictional story, but a real case. In August 2019, in Marion County, Florida, Kathy Jones and her children suddenly disappeared. The family started getting text messages from her, but then they became suspicious and called the police. The results of the police investigation are really shocking. What the hell happened? What happened to Kathy and her children? Who is playing tricks? Marion County is a little treasure in Florida, with beautiful scenery, a long history, and complete facilities. The place has a population of over 370,000 and is known for its hospitality and thriving economy. Visitors to Marion County can explore the stunning Ocala National Forest, stroll through downtown Ocala's historic district, or spend the day at one of the nearby theme parks. There's also a wide variety of restaurants, shopping centers and cultural attractions, making it an ideal destination for a short weekend getaway or an extended stay. Our story begins here. Michael Jones and Casey Jones got married on Halloween 2017. Before they met, they both had their own pasts. Michael was previously married to a woman named Sarah Jones and had three children. And Casey was previously married to Richard Powers and they have two boys. In 2018, the two welcomed a lovely daughter. Meckley. A family of six lives happily in Marion County. However, sudden and strange things began to happen. In July 2019, Casey's ex-husband Richard received a text asking if he could look after their two children, Cameron, 10, and Preston, 5. Richard said yes, and they agreed to meet at Leesburg Mall on July 27, 2019. In their text exchange, Kathy told Richard that since she was in the hospital recovering from back surgery, Michael would bring the children to see him. This is not surprising to Richard, after all, Casey did have previous back surgery. On the appointed day, Michael happily took the two children there, and they were also in a good mood. So the boys returned to their father for a few weeks. At that time, only Michael was with the girls. On August 1, 2019, Casey's mother Nikki received a message from her daughter. In the message, Kathy asked Nikki if she could help babysit her two young children, Meckley, two, and Ayanna, one and Nikki is happy to help babysit from time to time agreed, everything looks normal and the girls are happily spending time with their grandma. As time went on, Nikki tried to reach her daughter Kathy via text and phone calls, but the calls went straight to voicemail, and she never received a response. Richard was also very worried. On August 22, 2019, the ex-husband tried to contact her, but all his attempts went unanswered. Friends and acquaintances also found it strange that Kathy hadn't been posting on social media recently, whereas she used to be active almost every day. The last time she posted was on August 26, 2019, and people began to speculate about what happened to her. By September, Nikki's concerns about her daughter had escalated to alarming levels. So, on September 14, 2019, Nikki decided to call the Marion County Sheriff's Office and request a health check of her daughter. In response, police dispatched Deputy Sheriff Chase Skin to the home of Michael and Casey. However, upon arrival, the house appeared to be empty and there was no response. When knocking on the door, it felt like the house was abandoned. The police then found Johnny Murphy, a neighbor who lived nearby. Johnny didn't know Michael and Kathy well, but saw them occasionally in the community. But Johnny mentioned a strange thing. Two weeks ago, Patrick asked Johnny to check Michael and Kathy's place together because there was a suspicious smell in the house. As soon as they entered the house, Johnny smelled an unbearable smell which filled the air. During the investigation, the police quickly contacted the property's landlord, Joseph Petrolino. Joseph told police he initiated deportation proceedings for Michael and Casey on or about August 23, 2019. Yet when he contacted Kathy, she said she had severed all contact with Michael and asked him to contact him. Joseph then contacted Michael, 
and soon received a text from Michael saying he was leaving the residence and leaving the keys on the counter. After that, Joseph tried to contact Michael several times, but failed to get in touch with him. The mystery of the disappearance of Michael, Kathy and their four children is getting more and more unsolved. Soon after, another police officer Moore also arrived at the scene. And they entered the house together with the consent of the landlord Joseph. When the door was opened and the house was entered, a rotting smell hit the face, and the officer immediately recognized the smell of rotting corpses. But there was absolutely no one in the house, and no signs of a human body. Subsequently, the crime squad quickly intervened, and more police officers rushed to the scene. Apparently, something went terribly wrong, and they soon discovered that one of Casey S. White's 2017 Chryslers was missing. Because the circumstances surrounding the disappearance of Casey and the children were so concerning, officers entered them into a missing persons database and told other officers to look for the white van with the missing rear window. In the early hours of September 15, 2019, detectives were still trying to figure out what happened to Michael, his wife Kathy and their children. They first tried to reach Michael by phone, but unfortunately, the phone indicated that they could not be reached. At about 10.16 a.m., they contacted Michael's ex-wife Sarah Jones, hoping to gather any information that could help locate the missing family members. During the phone call, Sarah revealed that the last time she saw Michael and Kathy was at a McDonald's in Palatka, Florida, on September 13, 2019, around 5.30 to 6 p.m. She was meeting with Michael at the time to visit the children. Casey, however, remained in their white Chrysler. Sarah further pointed out that Michael and Kathy looked the same. However Sarah claims, she did not see their baby that day. When investigators asked if there were other ways to find them, Sarah replied that she didn't know. Then the call ended. Investigators need to verify Sarah's statement. So, they retrieved the surveillance video of the McDonald's store. At noon that day, however, the detective reported that he had scrutinized video footage of the date and time Sarah claimed to have seen Michael and Kathy, but could not find the car on the footage. Investigators then tried to contact Sarah again, but were unable to get in touch. On September 15, 2019, at around 2.17 p.m., they received a voicemail from Sarah, which changed her original statement. Sarah revealed in the message that she did not see Casey on September 13, 2019, but she insisted that she had contact with Michael at the McDonald's store. Next, Sarah was told that a meeting was needed to clear the suspicions, and after being interviewed by the police minutes later, Sarah completely retracted her previous statement and denied that she had met Michael at McDonald's on September 13, 2019. At this point, investigators knew they couldn't believe anything Sarah said, and they had to find another way to uncover the truth. Investigators also conducted a phone interview with Michael's mother, Connie Leclerc, on the afternoon of September 15, 2019. Connie revealed that Sarah, as Michael's ex-wife, told her that the last time she saw Michael and Kathy was on September 13, 2019. Texted her son the same day and confirmed he and Kathy were fine. There was even mention of their plans to visit Kathy's family in Kentucky. As the interviews wind down, Investigators are faced with more questions than answers. At 3.07 p.m. that day, investigators received a surprising voicemail. That was Michael himself. He heard law enforcement was looking for him and his family. Michael admitted he was out of town, but would arrive later that day or the next morning. When investigators tried to call back, however, no one answered. During this time, Casey's ex-husband Richard also called. He was on holiday in the UK when he saw a Facebook post looking for information on Casey. Richard then recounted a conversation he had with his two sons. They spent time with Michael and Casey from late July to early August 2019. Cameron revealed to Richard that Kathy's current husband, Michael, was violent towards her. According to Cameron, Michael and Casey had violent confrontations that lasted for hours almost every night. Shockingly, 
he also revealed that Michael was abusing the children at home. Confronted with this information, officers arrived at Sarah S. Florida home around 5.30 p.m., but he knocked on the door, but there was no answer, so he waited in the parking lot and finally saw Sarah's car drive up. He approached her and Sarah began to tell about her past with Michael, whom she had been with since 2007. She detailed how they married in 2011, but ended up separating because of Michael's affair with his current wife, Kathy. Sarah explained that since April 2018, she and Michael have had very little communication. However, in the last two weeks of July 2019, Michael contacted her out of the blue to say that he and Kathy were considering a divorce. In the next few weeks, Michael picked up the children back and forth and took them to Marion County. Sarah revealed that on July 26, 2019, Michael went to pick up the children from her house and did not send them back until before school started on August 11. The next few weekends were the same. Sarah said that on the night of August 30, 2019, Michael came to her home and has lived there since then, only leaving for a few hours during the day on September 10, 2019 to attend to some personal business. Sarah went on to say she confronted Michael when she got a call from the police asking about Kathy's whereabouts. So the false statement about the meeting at McDonald's mentioned above happened, after speaking to the police, she confronted Michael. Again and urged him to deal with the matter. She told Michael to call the police, and he did call them on his son's cell phone. Afterwards, Michael left Sarah's house, saying he was going to deal with the issue. He left within an hour of the time detectives arrived at her home. Sarah also mentioned that Michael left a black laptop for the kids. Sarah proposes that the detectives take the computer and investigate to see if there is any evidence on it. On September 15, 2019, at approximately 8 p.m., the sheriff's office received a report of a traffic accident in a rural area not far from the Florida-Georgia border. They rushed to the scene only to see a white Chrysler van crash into the gutter. When the officers inspected the scene, they were stunned by what they saw because the driver in the van turned out to be the Michael they were looking for. Michael appeared to be unscathed and when asked if he was injured, he replied no. But the deputy's attention was drawn to a smell that he knew very well, the smell of dead bodies that he had known from his years of policing. He subconsciously let go of the weapon on his waist, preparing for the worst. Next, he asked Michael about the smell, hoping for an explanation. But what he never thought of was. Michael calmly said that the source of the smell was his wife Kathy. Shocked and overwhelmed, the deputy could hardly believe what he had just heard. He asked Michael to make it clear. Michael said calmly that he had killed his wife and her body was in the car. The deputy immediately called for reinforcements and soon police cars were pouring in across the area. While reinforcements arrive, Michael continues his story. Not only did he kill his wife, he also took the lives of their four children. The officers followed Michael's lead to the wooded area where he hid his body, about six miles from the scene of the accident. The body was found in a plastic storage box covered in palm leaves. Subsequently, Michael was detained. During the ensuing interrogation, detectives listened in shock as he recounted the death. Michael revealed that he and Kathy were together for five years and married for two. They met while working together at a veterinary clinic. The two had been fighting, but not to the point of getting into a fight, when Michael, who was divorcing Sarah, started dating Kathy. Michael and Kathy's relationship is not going well. On July 10, 2019, however, things took a turn for the worse. On that day, Casey called him at work and accused him of cheating. According to Michael, he hung up and turned off his phone. But when he got home, Kathy refused to leave. She tapped his head with her phone. Their argument quickly escalated, and Michael ordered Casey to leave. But Casey picked up a baseball bat. Then call, in a rage. Michael grabbed the baseball bat and repeatedly hit her on the head until she died. Afterwards, Michael wrapped her up, put her in a storage box, and put her in the master bedroom wardrobe. 
The children were asleep when the incident occurred. Michael knew he had to clear the scene quickly before anyone found out. So he packed the baseball, bat and other items into a garbage bag and threw it in a dumpster on Route 441. Things get more horrific as Michael confesses his crimes to the police. After killing his wife, he is terrified but must continue to pretend she is alive. So he started sending text messages from his wife's phone to make it appear she was still alive. Then send the children to their father Richard and their grandmother. Then make an appointment to pick them up sometime. As Michael continues his story, he reveals details of how he killed four children. First up is Cameron. It was late at night when Michael entered the children's bedroom. Pulled Cameron from the bed and put his hands around his neck. As Cameron struggled, Michael knelt on his chest and choked until the boy stopped breathing. After the incident, Michael stuffed Cameron's body into a suitcase and put it in the corner of the east bedroom. The next night, Michael killed the second child, Preston. His hands were sore from the night before with Cameron, so he came up with a new idea. He went to the guest bathroom, turned on the faucet and blocked the tub drain with a towel then sneaked into the children's bedroom, where Preston was sleeping. He picked up a plastic bag, slipped it around Preston's neck, and pulled it so tight that he couldn't breathe. Michael then dragged Preston into the bathroom and pressed his face into the tub until he stopped struggling. Then put into a garbage bag and left in the bathroom for a few days. Then put the body into a large box. He also used cat litter to soak up bodily fluids from the decomposing corpse. Michael went on to recall that a few days after killing his two sons, he was actually near City Hall, staring down at the police station, where he sat with his daughter for hours. Hesitating whether to surrender himself or wait for someone to contact him. But he couldn't muster up the courage to turn himself in. Then left and drove aimlessly for several hours. When he got home, he decided to end the lives of his two young daughters. Using the method above, he killed his daughters Meckley and Ayanna in turn. Both girls were stuffed into the same huge box. Michael went on to say that one day in late August or early September 2019, he loaded the previous body into the van. Detergent, mothballs and insecticide spray were used inside the van to try to mask the stench of rotting corpses. In fact, he was so overwhelmed that his only plan was to leave Florida for now. Or cross the border, driving aimlessly until he saw a trail on the side of the road and decided to stop. At that moment, he decided to take the large box containing the body out of the van and throw it into the woods. Afterwards, continued driving north. Until a traffic accident happened. The community remains in shock and grief as Michael's trial looms. People can't understand why such a terrible event happened in an ordinary family. The media reported the case one after another, which aroused widespread public concern. On the first day of the trial, the courtroom was solemn and solemn. Facing the gaze of the jury and the spectators, Michael had no expression on his face. Counsel for the prosecution calmly and firmly stated all the charges and argued for the death penalty. They described Michael's brutal actions and his merciless taking of the lives of four innocent children. The defense lawyers advocated life imprisonment. They tried to reveal Michael's past psychological difficulties and tragic childhood experiences. They believed that a life sentence would give Michael the opportunity to reflect and repent, even though the life of an innocent child was irreversible regardless of the sentence. The trial went on for several weeks during which witnesses recounted details of the case and Michael's actions. The testimony of each witness was heartbreaking and the pain and horror of innocent children were fully revealed at the trial scene. Michael's defense lawyers tried to challenge the reliability of the witnesses and the veracity of the testimony, but the evidence piled up and was almost impossible to refute. Ultimately, after lengthy debate, the jury reached its decision. The judge pronounced that Michael was sentenced to death. The verdict brought silence to the entire courtroom. Both the prosecution and the defense were shocked by the result. 
The outcome of the case means Michael will face ultimate punishment for the crime he committed. However, for Michael himself, the death sentence is also the end of his life. In his final moments in prison, he may experience inner struggle and regret. For those who loved him, not only have they lost a loved one, but a family and trust that once existed. While the Michael Jones case has left an indelible mark, it is believed that through a fair justice system and community unity, they can gradually return to normal and build a safer and more harmonious environment for the future.